Greetings and welcome back. This is part two of a four-part video lecture on ADHD lifetime implications for psychiatric nursing and advanced practice nurses. Adults with ADHD. ADHD persists into adulthood in about 30% of childhood ADHD cases, so that's an important piece to remember. About 56 percent of adults with ADHD have at least one or more other psychiatric disorders, another thing to be aware of in terms of comorbidity. Cause-specific mortality for suicide only was significantly higher among ADHD cases. So that is yet another reason to be especially aware of adults with ADHD and their mental health needs. ADHD behind the wheel. The risk level of dangerous and potentially lethal driving outcomes increased in children with ADHD. Among adolescents and young adults with ADHD compared to the same aged participants without ADHD, there were more traffic tickets and more accidents. In adults with ADHD, the prevalence rate is about 4.4 percent among 18 to 44 year olds in the United States based on the National Comorbidity Survey Replication Study. 3.4 percent with a range of 1.2 to 7.3 percent of respondents age 18 to 44 years in 10 countries in the Americas, Europe, the Middle East, <clears throat> according to the World Health Organization survey, demonstrated a persistent ADHD picture. In the United States, the comorbidities include mood disorders with an odd ratio, odds ratio of 2.7 to 7.5 percent, anxiety disorders with an odds ratio of 1.5 to 5.5, and any substance use disorder odds ratio of 3.0. Also intermittent explosive disorder was 3.5, excuse me, 3.7. So ADHD and cost. Researchers estimate that in the United States about $31.6 billion is the combined annual cost, but this includes several components. Not only health care for persons with ADHD specifically related to the diagnosis, but also all other health care costs of persons with ADHD, and then the health care for family members of persons with ADHD specifically related to their family member's diagnosis and then work absences among adults with ADHD and adult family members of persons with ADHD is estimated to be approximately $3.7 billion. So there is quite a cost involved. <clears throat> Let's look at adults with ADHD versus um, who were uh, children with ADHD. What we can see on the left is a slide of glucose metabolism, both global and regional, which was reduced in adults who had been hyperactive since childhood. The largest reductions were in the premotor cortex and the superior prefrontal cortex, areas earlier shown to be involved in the control of attention and motor activity. This has been known now since 1990. Risk factors for ADHD. Well, this certainly seems to be a genetic component with some hereditability present. Um, a maternal history of autoimmune diseases, which was discovered and uh, published in 2017. Cigarette smoking, alcohol use, and drug use during pregnancy added uh, an other risk factors. Exposure to environmental toxins during pregnancy and exposure to environmental toxins such as high levels of lead at a young age, also low birth weight infants, and those with brain injuries. So the ideology of ADHD is both hereditable and genetic, but there seems to be more to it than that, as with most psychiatric diagnoses. So 20 extent 
twin studies estimate the hereditability of ADHD to about to be about 0.76 or 76 percent. ADHD happens to be one of the most hereditable psychiatric disorders that we know of. Seven genes so far have shown statistically significant evidence of association with ADHD and some of these are related to the dopamine system as well as the serotonin syndrome uh, system. Pathophysiology of ADHD, the dopamine D4 receptor gene polymorphisms seem to play a part. The G protein coupled receptor kinase interacting protein 1 gene, 16 SNPs, which you should be familiar with from our genetics lecture, and 300 genes in the metabotropic glutaminergic system. Blood levels uh, of lead greater than 2.1 uh, micrograms uh, per deciliter. Um, they were in, these kids were in the highest quartile, many of them. And then catecholamine disruption is at least one source of ADHD brain dysfunction. So overall there seems to be brain functional connectivity abnormalities in the brains of individuals with ADHD. Additionally, catecholamine disruption is at least one source of ADHD brain dysfunction as mentioned. Uh, the dopamine system uh, with potent agonist of the D4 receptor and the noradrenaline system with potent agonist of the D4 receptor. So the DRD4 or the dopamine 4 receptor is also a prevalent in frontal subcortical networks and this has been implicated in the pathophysiology of ADHD by neuroimaging and neuropsychological studies. And then there is a seven repeat allele as well. So turning our attention to networks and neurotransmitters then, the network problems include those problems in the reward system, in the ability to focus, and the ability to plan, pay attention, and to shift between tasks as well as movement in some cases. And the neurotransmitters primarily involved are dopamine and norepinephrine. The overall clinical approach to the child-adolescent recommendations include screening in all children presenting for a mental health assessment and an evaluation which includes clinical interviews with both the parent and the patient and obtaining information about the patient's school or daycare functioning as well as a review of medical, social, and family histories. So the common behavioral rating skills used in the assessment of ADHD and the monitoring of treatment response include the academic performance rating scale, the ADHD rating scale, there are five for children and adolescents, and the child behavioral checklist, as well as the Connors third edition and the Vanderbilt ADHD diagnostic parent and teacher rating scale. Further recommendations include if the patient's medical history is unremarkable, laboratory or neurological testing is not necessarily indicated. The exceptions are patients and or family history of heart disease, especially arrhythmias, in which case an ECG is definitely something you want to get before starting a stimulant. Psychological and neuropsychological tests are not mandatory for the diagnosis of ADHD, but should be performed if the patient's history suggests a low general cognitive ability or low achievement in language or mathematics relative to the patient's intellectual ability. Further, we must evaluate for presence of comorbid psychiatric disorders. Thoughtful and comprehensive treatment planning and treatment plan development is essential and this can be rather complex. So educational and occupational evaluations and planning and parent individual support and guidance. So a referral to support groups is often helpful 
as well as a referral to CHAD, Children and Adults with Attention Deficit Disorder, a self-help support group that has a vast amount of information and guidance for people, as well as a uh, website and magazine, Attitude, A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E, which has a plethora of information, including information for clinicians. Now, the initial pharmacological treatment of ADHD should be with an FDA-approved agent for the treatment of ADHD. What we're going to do now is end part two and ask that you proceed to part three.